Thank you, Ahmad, uh, so much for this uh, introduction. Uh, and uh, thank you, everyone, really, for attending. It's heartwarming in uh, this moment of uh, global crisis and heightened Lebanese crisis. Uh, to see so many uh, people really making the time to uh, attend, participate in conversations. Uh, some of the names I see among the participants are people whose work has been incredibly inspiring for us for so many years and really helped us believe in urbanization uh, from uh, the Global South and with the Global South. And it's really very meaningful. We really look forward to your comments. Hopefully, uh, you will find that what we have to say can add to a conversation and help all of us really think about how do we uh, remain hopeful in a very difficult time. And really, uh, these are very difficult times. From the outset, those of you who uh, have uh, known uh, my work, the work of colleagues in the urban lab, uh, we are not people who care about finance. We, uh, did not start thinking that financialization mattered. Uh, banks seemed to us like annoying capitalist organizations. We rarely had much in bank accounts. And uh, we came to this research really thinking about the right to housing and believing in the right of housing, which came to, be, uh, to become even more important in the last decade as, um, as, the, as, as we began to notice that in Beirut, but also talking to colleagues in numerous other cities, housing was becoming a luxury, something we took for granted for a very long time. I'll just stop for a second to apologize about the beeps you're gonna hear on and off. This is the UPS system replacing the electricity that's breaking on and off. We are in a moment of real breakdown of the infrastructure in Beirut, and these are some of the repercussions. I, I really apologize about that if it becomes annoying. Sorry about that. So we came to housing and we began researching housing the way uh, everyone looks at housing. We looked at uh, how people accessed housing. I started looking at informal settlements, which seemed to be the place where most people were acquiring housing. And then I began to try and convince public housing agencies in Lebanon that housing was important and that they had to invest in it. So I began to study public housing agencies. And as I looked at the landscape of uh, what was producing uh, housing, I came to realize that really, if one wanted to understand why housing was bec becoming scarce and if one cared about the right to housing, we had to look uh, elsewhere was a time when some of my former students, now colleagues, uh, Marika Kreinen, who's participating here, Bruno Maro and others, uh, were starting their dissertations. And we began to look at ways in which we could uh, connect what we were seeing really with where uh, really things is. And I remember clearly Marika saying, it's in the banks, uh, stop looking in the wrong direction. So uh, it took us 10 years perhaps to be able to turn this dream into a concrete project. But uh, what, we can what we've certainly figured out over the last decade is that this notion of financialization has really emerged as a dominant face of neoliberalism. Uh, so traced back to the 1970s, uh, the analysis of the circulation of capital as framed by uh, people like David Harvey and others has really increasingly gained visibility over the last three, four years uh, in the housing literature, in the urban literature, where people have shown how uh, capital surplus has been reinvested for gain in the city. This has happened, uh, of course, globally. And uh, one of the main conclusions that people have came up with, looking at cases in South Africa, in Mozambique, but also in the United States, in England, in Brussels and elsewhere around the world, is that it's certainly threatening access to housing for many social groups. Uh, most dramatically, financialization has really uh, shifted the role of cities in national economies. So rather than hubs of productions, places where people can live, uh, where they can conduct their livelihoods, dream their futures, enact their politics, cities are becoming pieces of land made out of apartments that are actually hoarded by financial capital that 
has been allowed since the fall of the Bretton Woods agreements to increase exponentially. This is why we titled the presentation Cities for Sale, alluding to the transformation of the role of Beirut, which once was a hub for economic transactions, tourism, services, into really a speculative landscape which is essentially exploited for profit, trapped by investors. This transformation has major impacts on the lives of city dwellers to whom this quote-unquote real estate should be home, workspace, and playscape. And when we say the city and financialization, we are thinking about those high-end neighborhoods where one can visibly see capital, but we're also thinking about the implication of this financialization on other sections of the city where migrant workers, refugees, and other low-income communities have to stay, um, have to be confined because they can no longer access the spaces of the city. So, so while financialization, and, and so coming back to this notion of financialization, which granted has been overused and abused and really mostly studied in London, Paris and New York, which are exemplary cases, we felt that it was imperative to try and trace that money in the peripheral context of Lebanon, particularly of Beirut, and to really understand Beirut not as a variation on a theme park, on a uh, which is New York or London, but rather, and not as a departure of an ideal type of possible financialization, but rather as a ground up theorization of how it is materializing in one specific context in actual neighborhoods, mapping real actors and trying to understand how this materialization produces a certain anatomy of a growth machine that uh, we think has uh, had major, that we will show you, actually we will argue, has had major impacts on how uh, a, an imagined trajectory of capital actually materializes in a context where there are political parties, uh, their banks, their institutions, and people who are not passive recipient, but really trying to uh, negotiate, integrate within this. And so for the past uh, year and a half, we have tried to map these transformations of the housing market in Beirut in a very grounded methodology that began by looking at all the building permits that were um, granted inside Beirut and connect them to what we think are typically first uh, what researchers have called, if you want, financialization. So Luna, if you can share, uh, please, the, the first slide. Yeah, next. Thank you. So what you see here is a graph uh, that uh, shows all the building permits filed within municipal Beirut between 1996, which is five years after the end of the Lebanese Civil War, and 2018. From the outset, you'll say, why 1996? We'll tell you because we could not find in any public sector agency a data set that went before that date so far. So that's why we start with 1996. It's very simple. So we start with 1996, and we trace for every year the number of building permits. And we begin by tracing this in relation to what scholars have typically identified or associated with financialization. On the one hand, building development incentives. So these are changes in regulations like building law that you see law 646, where um, incentivizing development by allowing basically buildings to go higher and more intensely. And then second, uh, really a lot of facilitation of land transactions, either through the digitalization of the land registry or again by easing real estate acquisitions for non-Lebanese people, reducing the taxes so that they can uh, acquire more easily capital. The second set of incentives which you uh, often see is, uh, no, sorry, go back, my please, Luna, is uh, financial incentives. And uh, for uh, financial incentives, we find that rather than an imagined uh, sort of market that is responding to needs. So it's speaking in 2008 really because uh, there was a lot of housing demand. What you see is that actually this market responds to stimulus provided essentially by the central bank that incentivizes uh, private banks to invest in real estate through the provision of multiple forms of loan. Some of these loans, most all of these loans are subsidized. Some of them are targeting public sector agents who get their jobs through actually uh, 
uh, political networks and consequently acquire a package of benefits, including housing, by demonstrating allegiance to specific institutions. And one after the other, we see a rollout of institutions that begin to provide these loans and attract people into uh, this benefit and keep them within the political system. But also really quite interestingly, easing for the banks, allowing them to invest their uh, uh, their safety capital into the built environment, encouraging them, giving them incentives to provide loans and also lifting the restrictions on the maximum amount of numbers. So you'll see some things obscene, for example, by 2018, a subsidized bank, uh, loan from the central bank can go up to uh, 1.2 billion Lebanese pound, which at the time made something like 800,000 uh, US dollars. Uh, keep in mind the minimum wage in Lebanon is for, was $450 at the time. So uh, this is really massive subsidies for the rich. Um, now, capital, of course, comes from somewhere. We don't produce much capital in Lebanon. As you can see down from this graph, our balance of uh, payment is uh, quite dependent on foreign uh, investment. So when we map those foreign investments, we see that there's a substantial FDI coming into the country. But when you look at where it's coming, you see that most of it, more than two thirds of it, are going either in real estate or in uh, the residential sector. So again, in real estate. And so you ask, so where is this money being produced? Why, uh, who, where does it come from when it comes here? And so what we try to understand is to map this money in relation to oil prices. So the graph you see here maps in navy blue oil prices uh, and uh, in relation to building permits. And you see quite a correlation for most of the period, uh, particularly in that peak between 2000 and 2008, where the prices of oil peak and consequently the number of uh, building permits also uh, go back up. You will see, and I'll explain it in a little bit, that it stabilizes at 2008 while the market begins to crash, but that they actually pretty much crash together towards the end. Um, you see the, uh, on this graph, these are, these are pegged in relation to remittances. And again, you can see uh, that they work hand in hand. Um, so, uh, so, of course, these remittances and these flows of capital don't happen in limbo. And so what we wanted to say is that, we, is that they need to be located also within a political context. And that political context, particularly in the Middle East and in Lebanon today, needs to be understood nationally, internally, but also uh, globally and regionally. And when I say nationally, you will notice that some of the big, very big events that actually happened in Lebanon did not have much influence on the investments in the built environment. You'll notice, for example, that the 2006 Israel war on Lebanon barely impacts the curve of uh, building permits that continues to rise. Conversely, you will notice that as, as of 2008, uh, eight, nine, but really peaking as of 2012, we begin to see the beginning of serious US sanctions affecting the flow of capital on Lebanon as part of uh, targeting Hezbollah, targeting uh, Iran uh, indirectly through Lebanon. And this has major repercussions because the Gulf allies will prevent their nationals from visiting Lebanon. There will be increasing sanctions on specific banks that lose all their capital. And consequently, that crash in the national economy with a negative balance of payment is reflected in a crash in the real estate sector. This is just to sort of locate what happens to housing. So we're thinking about something which is a place where people need to live, to conduct livelihoods and to work. And rather than imagining that uh, it is the outcome of supply and demand or even a local speculation. We notice that in order to understand really the consequences of financialization, we need to locate uh, the trends within these global politics. Before we go on in explaining these trends, I'm going to pass on uh, this, uh, the presentation to Michelle, who will talk about the methodology of research. Indeed, for many of you, particularly those not working in the context of the Global South, it may seem that a curve of building permits like this or a survey is something you can obtain by download. In reality, as Michelle will tell you, it's something you build from scratch, bottom up, uh, for years. So, Michelle, floor is to you. Um, Thank you. All right. So, 
before we tr we try to collect the data from uh, about the buildings of Beirut, we needed a clean base map of Beirut because we did not have one. And the problem in Lebanon and is not the scarcity of the data; it's, it's it's scattered and it's not unified. So we ended up needing different types of data. The first set of data was uh, an Excel sheet from the Order of Engineering and Ar Architects in Beirut. Uh, we, we received from them all construction permits uh, permitted after 1996. We wanted the permits before 1996, but the um, order of engineering had a policy of destroying the permits every 10 years uh, before they started uh, to actually digitize the permits on an Excel sheet. Uh, and then uh, we collected four different maps of uh, municipal Beirut from four different sources, the municipality of Beirut, the land registry, the CNRS, and we also used an aerial image of Beirut. Um, and we, we, we georeferenced all the permits that we received, received onto the base map that we created using these four maps, four different maps. Okay. As you can see here in the image, the, the, the map was not final because we needed to check facts on the ground. We, there are permits that we could not find uh, in the base map. So we had we ended up with multiple back and forth trips to the uh, land register, uh, land registry and the cadaster in order to collect this information. Some permits were canceled like five years ago. We needed to update this information. Also, there were some discrepancies on the field. That's why I'll just to, to tell you ahead that because when we went to the field, sometimes we would see, the, see things differently from the map uh, that was created. For example, we would find a building on two parcels and these two parcels were actually joined. So we would take the note and go back to our GIS team and the mapping team in order to re-fix the, uh, the map. And as a side note with the CNRS, we uh, were able to digitize and draw uh, all the buildings in Beirut using the aerial image. And the, the number was over 18,000 buildings in Beirut. Okay, now moving to the field surveys. We had five teams of two working in different neighborhoods of Beirut. There were, we were using phone applications in order to collect the data and later consolidate it. Uh, from the order of engineering, we received over 2,600 permits and we used one of the application in order to guide the teams to the permits and then another application in order to collect the information on that but we only collected information on buildings newly constructed after 1996. Other than that, we would just take notes, whether the building is non-residential, whether the permit was not executed and left empty or used as a parking lot. But the main questions, which were over 50 questions, were only for new residential buildings. And the teams had a lot of challenge during these surveys because they faced a lot of um, uh, high security area, non-responsive buildings. There were many streets where they were not allowed to even walk into. So we, uh, it, was a, it's, it was a challenge on the field. And we also had, you know, because we had small neighborhoods and people were asking, why are you doing this? Why are you doing that? And it was, it was a challenge. We're using the online, uh, phone application, we were able to collect or gather all the data and they were accessed to a website. And from this website, we were able to download all, this, all the surveys and create layers of information from these questions because our questions included uh, questions on building characteristics, the number of floors, the use of the ground floor, uh, the, num the size of the apartment, uh, the developers, so we had a dif different layers created on the base map that we developed. As you can see on the slide, using the data from the order of engineering, the different maps, the field surveys, the ap phone applications that we used, we were able to create a kind of a better clean base map of, uh, of Beirut and on top of which we were able to create layers 
for example, uh, we were asking questions about the use of the ground floor. And by that, we were able to determine the number of the, the buildings where they had commercial use for the ground floor, such as a small market or a beauty shop and so on. So, and because we ask many questions, we have so far more than 50 layers for that. Um, before, uh, before going to the network, growth network, we wanted to uh, track the number of buildings that were filed over the years in municipal Beirut. And we wanted to see if there is a pattern, whether they were built in the core or in, around the city. For example, the early years, as you can see, the, the permits that were issued were around the, the city, next to the shore, they were not in the center. And these are areas that are more of a high class areas not middle class areas. But over, over the years following, uh, the, the, following the early years, we're able to see here that the permits were more scattered around the city and they were even more uh, scattered into the middle class areas. Okay, so one of our main focus uh, uh, in the questions that we had was the developers and the network of developers. We wanted to know who is building Beirut. We wanted to know who is involved, where is the capital? Uh, are they local? Are they companies? Are they investment companies? Are they banks, as Mona mentioned uh, before? So in order to do so, we Addition, I mean, addition to relying on our questions, we relied on uh, like a web, a spider web uh, way of searching. We were tracking the developers through their websites. We were tracking them through the uh, land register. We were tracking them through different websites that are similar to the land register, such as Five Index, Shimi Blam. We also track them using social uh, networks like Instagram and Facebook to see the advertisement they were putting, um, the, the, the areas they were building on, whether they are building, they are building in Beirut or they are building outside Beirut. We also resorted to newspaper articles because there are many, art many magazines that are specialized for real estate, so we were able to track them there as well. This is just a way to create a, hol a holistic image of the anatomy of growth. And we, for now, what we created was inside Beirut. And this is another image of the network. But now our next image is to go be, next step is to go beyond Beirut. We already started with Aramun. We did the base map of Aramun. Uh, we also did some of the surveys there and our next target is Mansouri as well. And these are uh, areas located outside Beirut and greater Beirut. And uh, that's it for now. And now I will just uh, give the floor to Abir who will explain uh, more about our findings. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so I just want to first note that our work only targets uh, the formal segment of the market without really addressing the city's informal section. So given the framework that Muna introduced, we started thinking what kind of housing market did Beirut produce and how does it serve, who does it serve and how? So some of our observations corroborate what people might already know, except that we are now able to quantify these assumptions and verify them. So even though Lebanon is a rentier state from the global south, we found market trends in Beirut's housing market that replicate financialization trends documented in other advanced economies such as London, Brussels, and New York. So these trends uh, mainly encompass high vacancy rates, inflation of property prices, a strict segmentation of the market and changing trends in apartments structural characteristics. So apartment vacancy rates are extremely high across the city. Here, a housing market does not respond to the local demand, but rather to a demand for investment, for securing assets and for the accumulation of wealth. We found that uh, this has been mainly intensified either by investment companies looking for short-term short -term investment opportunities in Lebanon, which as Muna has shown that the institutional framework in Lebanon promotes and incentivizes, and by Lebanese expatriates who often 
uh, purchase uh, luxurious apartments uh, in Beirut as a safe destin destination for their accumulated wealth. Uh, so this almost exclusive channeling of capital into the real estate sector translated into major apartment vacancies in Beirut with more than 7,000 apartments as one testimony that apartments are used for, used for wealth accumulation rather than for their mere end use. Uh, so this is a quarter of the housing stock uh, in Beirut is vacant and we see sections uh, in Beirut such as uh, the downtown completely dysfunctional due to the high concentration of vacancy, whereby one in two apartments uh, in uh, Beirut Solidar uh, are empty. So here, uh, Beirut's historic core, which is developed by the private company Solidar, provides a glaring example of an urban district turned into a safety deposit box rather than a, an engine of growth for which it was granted incentives in the first place uh, for and tax breaks. It is also worth pointing that even under economic crises as these that we're living in right now, the process of financialization is becoming more intensified and the concept of safety deposit boxes is reinforced. We see that the, the breakdown of the Lebanese banking sector has also encouraged many to invest in real estate, thus intensifying the ongoing trend of using vacant apartments in Beirut as assets and increasing the share value of private in investment companies in the city. Uh, it is also important to mention so that we don't understand vacancy as, um, so we don't understand vacancy as the uh, stagnation of the market, that with the increasing financialization, housing uh, production in Beirut became more inflated and less self-regulating. So vacancy does not come as a result of the stagnation of the market, as I said, but as a result of the speculative practices. Why? While one might think that in line with basic economics, uh, an increase in the supply of apartments as shown in this chart would bring down prices. But we see in, uh, in the chart that actually the increase in the supply of apartments, uh, uh, this, uh, this is an example from one of the neighborhoods, uh, since the 2004 has actually picked along a trend of apartment uh, price increases, uh, which has reached threefold its original price in the early 2000s. This is noting that uh, by the time of the survey, a considerable 15% of the housing stock was put on the market for sale. Um, so when we transposed uh, this concept on the whole city of Beirut, we observed similar trends of intensification of real estate activity since 1996, coupled by the increase in average apartment uh, unit prices. The patterns are however dissimilar uh, we see that the increase in prices is triggered by the migration of building activity from more central high-end areas into more affordable zones in Beirut. So for example, when we compared uh, the building activity of two uh, neighborhoods that are actually adjacent but of different market segments, such as Tal Tal Khayyat, which is uh, considerably an upper income neighborhood, and Aisha Bakkar, which is considered a lower to middle income neighborhood, we, we see that uh, obviously there's a different trend in the construction activity whereby the dip in the permitting in Tal Tal Khayyat, an upper income area, is much earlier than those in uh, lower income areas. So uh, if we move on from the inflation of apartment uh, prices, and given that it is in exchange for speculative purposes, uh, we see an inversely proportional trend in terms of apartment areas, where, whereby it is, we observe that they are increasingly becoming smaller. So for example, in 2003, more than 70% of the permitted projects had apartment areas that exceeded 200 square meters. But we see that by 2018 in this chart, more than 85% of these apartments, of the apartments that were permitted, had less than 150 square meters uh, in area. So this increase in the supply of small apartments is again not a response to the local demand, but comes as a result of many complex regulatory and speculative factors of which is the 2004 building law that has allowed many developers to gain more built up area to be able to build more and thus reduce the, side of, the sizes of the apartments in order to accommodate more units and sell uh, for a higher margin of profit. 
So what does this tell us? When we look at the housing market in Beirut in the past 20 years, we see a line of variegated construction activity, the similar patterns of apartment sizes, fluctuating unit prices and vacancy rates. So Beirut's housing market today appears to be to have become heavily segmented. We see a, clear, a clearly produced segregation between neighborhoods of different class. When, uh, when we distinguish between projects across uh, unit prices and apartment sizes. So, so while the mostly priced apartments are mostly concentrated around the coastal zones, uh, least priced apartments uh, are uh, clustered uh, on the other end of the city, when we see in the next slide. So additionally, uh, subsidized housing loans uh, demonstrate a clear testimony of the segment segmentation of the market along class, whereby the loans are exclusively present in lower income areas in the city, as you can see. Yet we can say that the dependence on housing loans in general is limited uh, and less prevalent in Beirut comparing, comparing to other areas uh, in Lebanon, whereby uh, it only uh, takes up 4% of, uh, of the housing loans subsidized by the public corporation of, uh, of, house, of housing in Lebanon are channeled only to Beirut's apartments. I won't go into details about housing loan, but I would like to note that this is also part of a different study that is underway uh, that investigates the impact of different types of housing loans on different regions inside and outside Beirut. Uh, so back again, we also know that the heavy segmentation of the market does not come across class only. Several studies have also addressed segmentation of the market along social characteristics, such as race in the US. So when we transpose this into Lebanon, we found that segmentation is extremely strict and defined by more complex realities, such as religious sectarian divisions, whereby as Suha will show in the following sections, uh, developers continue to reproduce uh, sectarian and social divisions by almost exclusively operating within the comfort of their social fields, or as we can say, and as shown in this map, the sectarian enclaves and the inherited lines uh, from the civil war. Thank you so much, Adil. And so uh, building on, on what Adir just presented as market segmentation based on sectarian and class differences, uh, we further actually investigated the anatomy of the growth machine to unravel what Mona also talked about and mentioned earlier and defined as actually existing financialization in Beirut. And so we actually relied on the concept of the growth machine as con uh, coined by Moloch and Harvey in the 70s, which points to the embeddedness of city developers within other power structures of the city. Uh, so as a lucrative and profitable investment, uh, it is attractive to actors who are influential in changing urban regulations, in bending building laws, and securing financial facilities, and more generally in transforming the real estate sector. And so rather than seeing financialization as a trend uh, that merely penetrates real estate through flows of capital, we ha uh, highlight the anatomy of a growth machine that works uh, to reorganize the structures and the conditions in which these investments happen. And so that's why I'm going to show you right now a data set that explains how we are going, uh, we have conducted this study. Uh, which includes over, uh, over 1,000 developers uh, who have built in Beirut over the past 20 years. Okay, can you see the screen? Okay. Uh, so for us, in order to understand the growth machine, this, what this data set does is that it links the sources of finance of the developers in Beirut with uh, the network that they rely on, the sectarian and the social networks they rely on, as well as the entry points of the housing market and the segmentation of the housing market, which Abir uh, just described. Uh, as you can see here, this is a whole list of all of the developers of Beirut who built over the past 20 years. And so if I zoom in on this data set, what I can see here is that first we have, of course, the name of the developer. Uh, who built, which is based on the uh, survey that we've conducted, as mentioned by Michelle, uh, the number of development of the projects and the area they built in. And so we classified these developers based on their sources of finance in order for us not only to measure uh, how much the market is financialized, which is also 
uh, one of the tools that uh, Romanville mentioned in her study on Brussels on the housing market. So she looks at the financial institutions in order for her to say uh, how much the market is financialized, but also for us to understand how the policies that we just mentioned in terms of the policy of, of the central bank, how much they contributed to the financialization of the market actually. And so uh, in terms of classification of developers, we're seeing here first uh, the, the share of the banks the shares of the investment companies. And then we're seeing a second layer of real estate developers, those who have other businesses, uh, such as uh, uh, developers who own an electronics shop or any other business. Uh, and these developers were lured by the market because of the policies Mona mentioned, and they channeled their capital that's accumulated by these businesses into uh, their real estate environment. We then classified the third layer of developers, those who are more amateur developers or uh, failed amateur developers or build, uh, owner builder developers. These are developers who have built only once or twice and they have very limited uh, sources of finance. And so we link this actually to the profile of the developer and to the profile of the company itself. And so when we talk about the profile of the developer, we're looking at their membership and affiliation and the developer sector for us to link the social network with the financial tools that they, they're using, as well as the type of the companies that they are using. And so, for example, if I look at the banks, which is the first uh, share of the market at the banks and uh, the investment companies, if you can uh, share back your screen, please. Uh, uh, And so if we look at the share of the banks and the investment companies from the real estate market, we see that only 2% of the developers are banks and investment companies. However, they have a very substantial share from the real estate market, which is around 10%. And they're very much geographically located along the high-end market, along the coast, or along uh, the historical uh, city core, which is linked to what Abir was mentioning in terms of how the market is segmented in terms of class and size. And this also resonates with what Romanville has mentioned as uh, how the financialization of housing is happening across a very specific market segment, not across the city in a very seamless way. And uh, this brings us back to, so can you unshare your screen? And so if we look at another set of, uh, another uh, uh, category of developers. I'm going to show you here another example, which is Highland, uh, one of the developers in Beirut, who is a professional developer and who actually calls himself Highland, which is very a very Western name, actually. But if we look at, so this is Highland Construction Group, who has a very Western name. However, if we looked further into the company owners and those who they partner with, we can actually see that the family names are family names of those who are very much a Beiruti family, so they're not really a Western. And this also affects the areas where they built their building activities. So they built in very, uh, uh, a very specific market segment, which is very much Muslim Sunni, which is also linked to their membership and affiliation. So they're affiliated to the Masharia Islamic institution which also in turn, in, uh, in turn sorry, uh, affect the other sources of finance they use. So they use silent investors from the Masharia institution for them to uh, attract investment into uh, the built environment. And so here we're seeing how all of these elements, the social networks and the financial tools they using do affect uh, how the developers are operating in the market. Uh, Duna, can you share back your screen, please? Okay. And so, okay. And so the developer I just talked about is the developer we're seeing here is highlighted in yellow. And so uh, we are seeing here a network that is spreading across two neighborhoods of Beirut's uh, low to middle class neighborhoods. It shows that they both actually use political and sectarian networks to capitalize on the real estate market in general and uh, hence invest in each other's projects uh, in these uh, two neighborhoods. And this is, uh, of course, not only because they have uh, limited uh, uh, sources of finance or limited social networks, it's because they do want to protect the territorial boundaries of these 
neighborhood. And so the yellow network that we just talked about shows how developers use their connections uh, to one Muslim Sunni religious political institution to attract clients, uh, but also to have access to land. And so uh, the other network that we're seeing, which is the blue one, it shows how one family relies on political affiliations to have access to the municipality, as we can see here, through the future movement. And hence, this eases uh, business in the construction sector and real estate development as a whole. Uh, the next slide, please, Anna. Okay. Uh, here we're seeing a, a, a different case, a different anatomy, a different uh, case from uh, the growth machine, which uh, looks at uh, the involvement of one developer who owns uh, shares in two banks, as you can see here, he's on the board of directors of two Lebanese banks. Uh, his brother is also uh, a politician who serves in the Lebanese parliament and the cabinet since 1992 under the liberation and development bloc led by the Amal movement, as you can see here. Uh, and so uh, his brother, who's a politician, he drafted the building law in 2004. He contributed to the drafting of the building law. And we know that this law increased the allowable built up area and contributed excessively to housing financialization. So both the developer and his brother, who's a politician, uh, currently they both have shares in a wide range of companies, as we can see here, of course. Uh, this includes real estate companies, but is not limited to real estate companies. And so what we aim to show here is that there is a link between the political class, between the real estate sector and the built environment, which extends beyond classic social networking. And it actually shows that the anatomy of the growth machine has very deep roots in the legislative uh, framework. Uh, Okay, here we're just seeing some photos of the developer I just mentioned earlier. It just shows how the developer and his brother are working and networking with politicians, with political parties, and with heads of banks and uh, the association of banks in Lebanon. Okay. Um, uh, another example of uh, a network that involves different actors shows that a project which seems to be built by a real estate company called Rehab, for example, in this case, uses SPVs, uh, and it has actually roots in one of Beirut's alpha banks, which is called the Bank Med here in this case. And so this bank and the real estate company, uh, their shareholders are all eventually belong to a very well-known family, whose one of its members belongs to the political class of Beirut. In this case, it's actually the future movement. And it also includes a Jordanian businessman who repeatedly bought properties, companies, and assets from this family under the claim of saving them from bankruptcy. Okay, and so the last network I'm going to talk about here, it shows a triad of three real estate developers and in, uh, involved in continuous fraud schemes in one of Beirut's territories. So these developers do have backing from a political party ranging from the future movement and it goes back historically to alliances with the Nasserif movement. And you can see that from the photos that are, uh, uh, that are on the slide. And so despite our under understanding of the growth machine as involving financial and social relations, this does not mean that informality does not penetrate the growth machine through fraud schemes and other forms of informality. Uh, one example of how uh, the developers use their sectarian networks to uh, capitalize on the market and for us to understand how the database that I've just shown helps us understand the spread of uh, uh, the building activity of the developers. It, it's uh, seen here uh, through the example of the spread of activity of developers of uh, one of the neighborhoods, which is Tari Ishdidi. And so the developers of Tari Ishdidi, for example, build always in low to middle class Muslim Sunni territories or neighborhoods. Uh, they refrain from high end uh, uh, neighborhoods in general, and they build along the western side of the city where they have access to land, social relations, and uh, certain uh, class networks. And so after explaining all of these uh, developers, the big fish developers, I just want to highlight that a very a substantial uh, part from the growth machine are uh, amateur developers who don't have access neither to banks, neither to political networks, neither to uh, financial tools. They don't have experience. And so uh, experience in the real estate market, of course. And so uh, these amateur developers who have defaulted, they have lost their investment. They've defaulted on uh, housing loans and they have 
lost all of uh, the capital that they have accumulated over the years from other uh, businesses. And so what we aim to show here is that this is the first layer of uh, financialization victims. Uh, they are very different from the developers that I've mentioned earlier. They don't have networks, as I've mentioned. And so this is a very huge section of the growth machine uh, that we need also to think of when thinking of uh, victims of financialization. It's not just about the residents, it's also for us about the developers. And so I'm going to uh, give back the floor to you, Mona, to conclude with, uh, with this. Oh, it's a second to remember, I'm muting. Uh, I, I'm very conscious of time. I do not want to uh, really take away from the possibility to discuss uh, uh, all of this, but really just to, uh, to, for three minutes, and I promise three minutes, say so what of uh, all of uh, this work. To me, there's uh, first something really uh, important for, uh, for our understanding of land and housing market. And I'll just say quickly a few things that I uh, found to be imperative to be placed on the table. While many researchers have looked to analyze the size and consequence of financialization by just looking at banks, and coming up with conclusions that markets like Mozambique or elsewhere are not really affected by financialization. I think what we're demonstrating here is that one needs to look beyond the mere size of banks, which substantial or not is a very small way um, in which financialization affects markets, but that more generally what it has created is a much larger network. And that network, uh, and this is my second point, needs to be imagined beyond the banks by relocating the financial flows and the banks within the larger uh, regional, global, and local forces to be able to understand the actual consequence of this financialization. So this is, uh, is really important because then the size and consequence of financialization and how we think through housing policy changes completely. The second point uh, that I'd really like to make is about informality, really a theme uh, dear to my heart. I think what we demonstrate through this research is that uh, the fiction that informality is just about low income people accessing uh, uh, small housing segments is uh, very problematic. What uh, Soha has tried to show in the few slides that she has indicated uh, that she has pointed out to is uh, the extent to which uh, informal transactions, informal networks seep into changing laws, transforming behavior, and really marking the overall segment of uh, housing. So while we begin by uh, saying that we're only investigating a small segment of the housing market, and this is the formal segment. We want to contest this idea by really saying that what, by looking through informality in its multiple forms, we get to a much broader understanding of how uh, this financialization is actually expanding the framework of informality. So we should not think about it as discipline or IMF or uh, mere clean neoclassical transactions. They're actually at least as murky and uh, as anything else. And this we've already seen with Lisa Weinstein in India, and she's going to be presented some of this work next week with us in the next Thursday. Uh, but we think that this adds even more to, uh, the, um, to, the, to, to our understanding. Uh, my third theoretical point has to do with uh, the heavy embeddedness of this financialization within a political banking class and really having to develop the anatomy of every growth machine within its context and not think that we can derive lessons from one place to the other. And finally, really to expand that understanding of who are the victims of financialization and you're really just beginning to talk to low income families who have housing mortgages and are struggling to be able to pay them. So this is our next step, but also to developers who have taken loans and find themselves in very deep difficulty. So this whole shifting of the economy towards real estate and speculative real estate, we feel, has transformed, uh, shifted housing completely out of the hands of, uh, of, uh, of people, but also created new victims that need to be understood if we are to recover some of what our cities are. And so to leave you with sort of a bit of a positive note, I'll say that, yes, it looks terrible, but that our research, we feel, is finding a lot of echoes locally. And we're working on at least three levels. We're working uh, first with activists. So we have been, um, all the graphs you've seen here have been translated. We've 
spoken about them in local NGOs, on the street and public squares. We've shared them online in Arabic and in English. We've uh, wrote, written op ads about them. We continue to do so. We feel that we're creating, we're contributing to an ecosystem of change that's really reclaiming housing as a right. And uh, I'm sure Zena is going to rebound on this and say much more. But for us, we feel that we really are able to demonstrate the usefulness of this research when it works in echo with others who are also pushing it in other directions. Our second level of investment is also with uh, public decision makers. So if this is a moment in which people need to, uh, to look for additional income for public agencies, we can use the vacancy and we've written a draft law with colleagues, lawyers, and we're trying to develop it and push it forward so that vacancies actually pass. And some of these speculative practices are held back. And finally, we think it's really important to talk directly to homeowners, to people who are going through the choice of how to access housing by empowering other ways of accessing housing than home ownership. And here really contributing to the rental market. So we're starting a registry of rent that will be available online that will allow some transparency for people looking for a home in this very difficult moment. And we're investing in this to become an open platform that we hope other activists will also use, but also every citizen as well can check. So as to overcome what we found to be one of the most difficult things people were facing when we asked them about housing, which is access to information, some visibility about a very informal, very opaque market. So I'll stop here, apologizing for taking so long. Thank you uh, for listening so well. I hope you are. It sometimes feels like you're crazy when you're on a webinar and you're speaking on your own. Um, and I'll uh, pass on the mic to you, Ahmad, so the discussants can join us. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mona, uh, Michelle, Abir, and Soha for this wonderful presentation. Um, uh, just quick acknowledgements before I forget at the end. I would like to thank uh, the visualization team who worked tirelessly, tirelessly on this presentation in a very short time, uh, particularly uh, Noor Zoghbi and, uh, and Talash Hayib, who's been helping us a lot during this recent period when it, when it comes to everything design. Um, and also, I want to thank Isabella for putting the presentation together. I hope I'm not forgetting anyone. Luna, of course, Luna, always, you know, you're at the, at the heart of all, of all of this planning. Nothing can really happen without you. So um, that's just my quick acknowledgements to the team before I move on to introducing our discussants. Allow me please to start with Marike uh, Kainen and, uh, and uh, uh, give her the floor and then I'll do the introductions to Hisham and, um, and Zena because Marike actually is on a tight schedule. We don't have a lot of time, so without any further ado, Kreinen is a full-time editor specializing in copy editing academic manuscripts. She obtained an MA from the American University of Beirut in 2010 and her PhD in political science in 2016 from Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, she completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the Orient Institute in Beirut in, in 2016-17 and her thesis looked particularly at the urban transformation of Beirut following the 2008 financial crisis and focused on the role of real state developers and the banking sector herein. So you can imagine how relevant uh, Marike's work is actually to ours, Marike's research. And we have to also say that Marike is, um, is a Beiruti in her own regard, uh, given that she has uh, lived here for uh, quite some time. Um, very briefly, uh, she has published several articles on gentrification and the rent gap in Beirut. Uh, with a strong background in urban studies, geography, and the political economy of the Middle East. She is currently enrolled in the Professional Editing Standards Certificate Program at Queen's University in Canada, um, as well as the Proofreaders and Editors, um, oh, sorry, as well as SENSE, which is a Society for English Language Professionals in the Netherlands. Um, welcome, Marike, and uh, the floor is yours, please, for any kind of question that you might throw back uh, at the at, uh, presenters. 
Thank you. Thanks, Ahmad. Thanks a lot. Um, yeah, so as you could hear just now, I have uh, switched careers, so I'm no longer in academia, but um, Mona asked me to say a few things um, based on my uh, PhD and postdoctoral research um, at the time um, in 2016. So um, I actually was going uh, through my PhD thesis um, this afternoon and it was interesting to revisit it a little bit. So that was fun. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about branding, uh, what that the developers do and also about the displacement that people face because you know, uh, when you see all the numbers, um, you don't see how all this capital investment actually touches down in specific areas with specific contexts, with, with uh, specific histories and all that kind of stuff. So just to provide a bit of uh, a context for that. So, um, for example, the area of Mar Michael, uh, which is in uh, the east uh, part of Beirut, um, started gentrifying a lot. And it has taken a very specific uh, form of gentrification. I call it nightlife gentrification, but it could, of course, also be, um, you know, be called creative gentrification in the beginning, if you want. So around 2010, there, were, uh, there was this general trend where consultancies were trying to bring the knowledge economy and creative entrepreneurs to the global south as this kind of like development trope. And some consultancies um, hooked onto this narrative uh, saying, you know, this could save Lebanon and prevent its young people from leaving um, if we can create a strong knowledge economy here. So we should support the settlement of creative entrepreneurs. So in this kind of um, general moods and discourse, um, the the developers uh, found a way of marketing their, uh, their products. Um, so it is true that some designers and architects and other creative entrepreneurs started to settle in this area on Michael because it had a nice small town feel, but especially because the rents were lower. Uh, this began in 2005 already. Uh, so you had a small cluster. Um, then other services, of course, followed and settled in the area. So you had services like cafes and bars and restaurants that were attracted again also by the lower prices because the area um, just west of Mar Michael Gymnasia was quite saturated um, and also um, they could you know find a home in the small um, ground floor spaces uh, of the older buildings which provided a kind of a charm I guess um, for the whole thing. Um, Real estate developers started to buy plots at the same time. So I think it's important to emphasize that they were already buying plots at this time. It's not like they followed the creatives uh, as they like to say themselves. That's not exactly what happened. They were also attracted by the lower prices. This is really a question of capital moving around and finding uh, the best margins. Um, but they used the trendy image of the area. So that's basically What's so interesting, uh, they used it in the design of their projects, they used it in the marketing of their projects. Uh, one developer called their project Bobo, for example, so Bohemian Bourgeois, which is uh, mildly hilarious. And uh, another one launched their project in an art gallery and they do referred to the boiling underground art scene, you know, on, on the website. So, so what you have is that developers uh, hook onto this already existing image or trend and they use it in their marketing and design. Uh, other developers will use other things in other areas that really depends on uh, the area. Of course, as a consequence, you know, people with more means now had things to buy there and uh, wanted to move there. So prices generally went up and this had consequences for local residents, um, unless they were on rent control, of course, but um, as you will see, it still had consequences. Um, even though many people were protected by rent controls. And even these rent controls have been uh, dismantled in the past year. So uh, that's not no longer forming any protection for them. Um, but we should also look at other forms of displacement pressure. So what happened is that the neighborhood basically became a nightmare for its residents because it used to be a very quiet um, area and it became extremely loud and extremely crowded with nightlife and cars and bars and, you know, uh, you have, this population was very rooted, had been there for generations, and uh, was quite vulnerable in the sense that they didn't have many other resources uh, at their disposal, um, not many means to complain or go elsewhere. Of course, they did you know, come together and organize, but it's very hard to, uh, 
to not only be deprived of sleep, but also face like a vomit on your doorstep every day. And, you know, all these consequences of that wild nightlife that was uh, going on. Also, they were mostly elderly. Most of them didn't have cars, you know. Um, so it explains also why, you know, if an investor would come to this area and offer people money to go, that some people would take it and go, even though they wouldn't face direct displacement. So I think it's important to keep that in mind that developers can use this, but also um, displacement pressures are multiple. Um, another consequence is that uh, um, their social networks um, are dismantled because the shops that they used to go to to buy their groceries are replaced by bars or cafes. Um, so, you know, talking to your neighbors, um, talking to your shop owner, this all becomes impossible and you just, you don't recognize your own neighborhood anymore. Uh, they also call this uh, social cultural displacement. So it's another grave consequence of, um, of such developments. Um, so in short, it's not only price pressures, but also uh, other forms of displacement that can lead to the total alienation of people and the loss of their support network and the loss of their livelihoods because many shops uh, were also owned by residents, for example. Um, so it's not only residents that are displaced, but small businesses as well. So we should also keep in mind that the commercial uh, displacement is, is a big problem um, and it's very much connected to residential displacement. Now, another example I can shortly mention is uh, Soho Beirut, which is uh, a bit on the same timeline, maybe a few years later, um, which is in the Kornish Nahr area, which is really on the eastern limit of the city, like the municipal limits uh, at the river side. So this is like a former industrial area. Um, and actually, if you look at it, uh, it was still quite active industrially, but the developers created this narrative of a virgin land and, um, you know, a former industrial area, which now in the post-industrial era, era, or, you know, whatever they call it, um, is ready to be, you know, converted into a, a residential space. Um, so, you know, they refer to the meatpacking district in Manhattan and Williamsburg and, and Berlin. And so they, they, they take all these um, tropes from other places um, to sell the projects that they are developing there. Now you see there the same thing, like you have an emerging arts cluster at the time. This is in 2009, 10, I would say. Uh, the media is starting to talk about an emerging creative hub. They want to call it uh, SOAT, uh, so south of Atelier, but it's actually north of Atelier, I think, but anyway. Um, and, you know, they call their projects like Artist Lofts or Factory 4376. Um, and some of them come together and they want to market their cluster uh, as Soho Beirut to attract buyers, uh, which is, you know, ironic because at the end uh, they didn't convert any existing industrial buildings into new buildings uh, or into, you know, uh, residential lofts or something like that, but they just demolished them and constructed completely new buildings uh, that didn't have many loft elements because people actually wanted to have walls. They didn't want to have a loft house. Uh, still, um, you know, they, they actually sold most of their apartments and it was a consistent and very successful marketing trope. Um, this of course also led to various forms of displacement, although it was quite different. So many industrial workshops that still existed were bought and then they were demolished, um, despite, you know, the developers saying that it was a virgin area. Um, existing agricultural fields were sold by their owners who could never have dreamed of, you know, um, selling that place that had such a bad image before um, for so much money. Um, you know, there were conflicts between uh, factories and developers, as they said, you know, developers are encroaching on our land. Uh, art spaces that rented space there were forced to sometimes close down because of price increases or their owners selling the place. So there were all kinds of uh, other consequences. So um, to conclude, I think it's important to remember that the real estate boom and the financialization of housing in Beirut uh, and elsewhere, of course, materialize in very specific contexts. And um, that developers, of course, they are always driven by profit margins. So they're always gonna look at the land price and they're always gonna look at how much can I sell this for, but they are using stuff like art clusters or an area becoming trendy or a kind of a discourse or a trend in the media, they are using that to sell their project. So they are, creating extra value through that uh, by latching onto these existing global trends. 
And it's also important to keep in mind that uh, not only residents are being displaced, but also small commercial establishments who serve those residents and provide them with their livelihood sometimes. And it's important to remember that for people, there are different kinds of displacement pressure. So they're not just uh, driven away by price increases, but also by changing environments, by nightlife, by traffic and other things. So um, that's basically all I wanted to say about that. Thank you. I'm sorry I have to leave now <laughs> because I have to catch a bus, but I hope you have a great rest of the session. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Marike, for your uh, comments. Um, much appreciated. Um, and sorry, you're going to have to leave us uh, quickly, not stay with us till the end. Uh, we will um, move on now. I will, I will introduce our other two uh, participants, our other two discussants, sorry, for today. So we have with us also Hisham Ash'ar, who is a doctor of economics and social sciences. Um, he's an urban planner, architect, cartographer, photographer, and investigative journalist. Uh, he is also an occasional lecturer at the Lebanese University in the Department of Urban Planning. His research centers on the relation between um, political economic systems and the production of urban space with a particular focus on uh, the gentrification process. Um, welcome Hisham and thank you for being with us today. We also have with us uh, Zain al Hello who is the founder and lead researcher of RAI for Research and Development, which is a private research company established in Beirut in 2015. Uh, prior to that, Zena worked in several positions, including the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies uh, from 2006 to 2010. She is the author of a large number of reports and research papers tackling issues of radicalization in Lebanon, independence of elections and others. She is currently associated with LCPS, uh, the Lebanese Center for Policy Studies, as a senior researcher. Um, forgive me, Zain, others, uh, and Hisham, there's more that I can say about the two of you, but I will, uh, I will keep it uh, and, uh, um, with this for now. We're already at 7.15. So uh, if you may, please have your um, uh, interventions one after the other. Try to stay within the five to seven, seven minute uh, time, time limit. Uh, perhaps we'll start with Hisham and uh, followed by Zena for no particular reason. That's the order that they come on my paper. So let's do that. And I would just like to th remind the audience that they can continue on sending um, their uh, comments uh, or uh, questions, uh, whether it is through the Q&A, which I compi I'm compiling, or through the chat. Um, I will uh, try to squeeze as many of these in at the end after our uh, discussants make their interventions. And please, Hisham, the floor is yours. Okay, hi. Um, well, first, a word of thanks for all those who made this uh, webinar possible. And um, I hope this will be the last webinar because nothing beats meeting and interacting in person. Uh, also, uh, another note, apparently I'm not an occasional lecturer at the Lebanese University anymore. I signed some sort of a contract, so, um, yeah, so, uh, now back to the presentation. Congratulations, Isha. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs> um, well, the importance of the work of Urban, the urban Lab um, is that, uh, in the Lebanese environment, we compl nearly completely lack of data. So uh, what you've done is that you produced, that, that you are producing a good part, a good chunk of uh, data that can be exploited and use. Uh, well, just to clarify things, uh, because previously, usually the two uh, criteria used are building permits, and a cement production. And in my opinion, these two uh, criteria are misleading. So, uh, of course, the work you presented was built, uh, first was started building upon uh, the data of building permits, and then you went, uh, did the survey and collected further information. So, uh, yeah, it's a great uh, job, and I hope you make it public so we can all benefit from this raw data. Uh, but I have a couple of uh, 
remarks, well, since it's a work in progress, maybe you already thought of them, but uh, I guess it's good to mention them. First, let's go back to the building permits. I know the, the graphs you showed at the beginning uh, and all the related factors, political investment of other, was related to building permits. Uh, however, building permits, well, first, if you got a permit, doesn't mean that you're gonna build, construct this building. And second, uh, con constructing a building, it's a process that spans for many years, sometimes 10 years. So it's not an accurate uh, representation of situation. Even I can go further, constructing a building is not an accurate uh, representation because uh, during the boom in 2005-2010, uh, usually the dynamic was based on we sell the, uh, the building before constructing it, and in this way we finance the construction. So, um, so yes, yeah, so there's many criteria that sometimes are hidden uh, that need to be taken into consideration. And here I go to the second point, and I'll try to be brief, is about sectarianism and sectarian segmentation. Well, yes, it's true, but not always. Uh, maybe if we can take a look at the upscale market, uh, any sectarian dynamic might disappear. And here I can, uh, let's try to reveal the anonymity, anonymity of uh, this guy who affiliated to Amal movement, Yassin Jaber, and his brother Yahya Jaber. Well, uh, the Jaber group, uh, well, five years ago, and I think till now, they are the biggest investor, real estate investor in uh, Beirut. And uh, they invest nearly everywhere in upscale, mainly upscale residential building, regardless of uh, sectarian identities or so. So, um, so yeah, uh, I guess that's it. And thank you so much for this great effort. Thank you, Hisham, very much. Um, Zena, we can uh, move on to uh, your comments now. Yes, um, hi everyone, and uh, I'm very happy to be uh, among you. It's a very interesting presentation by uh, Mona, Suha, Abir, and Michelle, and I am uh, looking forward to receiving the full presentation and uh, uh, looking more into this uh, very insightful information that it has. Um, I'll talk, I'm not an urban planner, I'm not an architect, I have no clue about anything related to this. I am more into public policies. And I think I was invited here, even not in my capacity as a researcher, but more from uh, as an activist, because I started, um, I actually yani, contributed to launching the campaign, uh, the Mish Defain campaign, which is we will not pay. Uh, as a, as a result of the financial and economic crisis that the country is suffering from. And um, we found that uh, there is a huge burden on a lot of families uh, where their breadwinners uh, lost their jobs and they have uh, commitments, financial commitments to the banks for their housing. And this is where it all started, basically. This is where we started to know that there is no housing policy uh, as such. Uh, ever since uh, we finished our civil war and uh, started rebuilding uh, the, the country. Um, so, um, and the, the, the the Muasas al Amir al Iskan or the public uh, uh, company or public uh, organization for housing, uh, which was established in the mid 90s, uh, didn't actually completely fulfill its mandate in terms of uh, finding or uh, coming up with housing policies uh, in regards to the uh, middle income and lower middle income uh, uh, individuals in the, in the country. Uh, I was born and raised in, in Beirut uh, myself. My father was an illiterate uh, individual uh, with a, a kind of low income uh, job, but uh, he, even though he had this uh, 
credentials or these uh, features, uh, social and economic features, uh, he managed to uh, uh, to rent an apartment in the heart of Beirut in Ashrafiyye, uh, which I cannot do at this time, even though I have two masters and I consider myself to uh, be a little bit of a privileged individual in this current situation in Lebanon. This is to say that um, the, the, the middle income uh, individual have been driven away from Beirut uh, in the post-war uh, period. And uh, the data that you provided today in regards to the 4% of the housing loan that are subsidized by the central bank and by the uh, PHC, uh, I think it's PHC, the, the, the acronym for this uh, housing company, um, is very indicative of what I'm saying. The majority of people were driven away uh, from Beirut as a capital, and they now live in the suburbs, whether southern suburbs or uh, northern suburbs or whatever, uh, which is not a problem in itself, but it is a big problem when all the jobs are still located inside the administrative Beirut and uh, the, the, the very small districts of Beirut, which creates a huge problem related to mobility, related to transportation, and in the absence of public transportation, which also has increased the burden on families to have cars, to buy cars, and again, to uh, resort to uh, uh, debt, basically. So, um, from the data that we that we gathered throughout this campaign of the we will not pay, uh, we found out that uh, the the average family that fifty percent of the families in Lebanon, uh, uh, sorry, that uh, families pay fifty percent of their income um, as settlements of their debts to the banks. And this is mainly for housing and for cars, private cars, in the absence of, tra of, of public transportation uh, network linking Beirut and uh, the suburbs where the, the housing, it's not a policy per se, but the, the, the de facto uh, policy of the network developers and that, that you have explained in your research, this is the result. This is what it has resulted in basically in terms of the overall landscape of, of urban planning in, in Beirut and uh, in uh, Mount Lebanon or what is called the Greater Beirut uh, where I think 70 to 80 percent of uh, Lebanese people uh, uh, reside. Um, I think it's important also to note that uh, we're facing now a huge, um, uh, how do we call it, I think it's uh, a defaulting uh, on, uh, on housing loans. Uh, the latest data that we have is March 2019. I'm not sure if there is a, a, a more recent data uh, about this. Uh, and the defaulting was 14.4% for the housing loans. Uh, that was March 2019, so like more than a year ago. Uh, and back then, the, the real effects of the economic and financial crisis weren't as acute as we're seeing them uh, nowadays, I think that we're moving into uh, uh, a full-fledged defaulting on all families uh, and uh, and uh, loan owners in in that sense, which uh, which requires uh, a certain policy basically to deal with this uh, with this is issue of uh, housing, especially that uh, we are already receiving as the campaign uh, complaints from individuals and families uh, for the, from defaulting families who have already been receiving uh, threats and, uh, um, and they're, they're receiving notices uh, from their banks, from the legal departments in the, in the banks uh, uh, in the, regarding the, the, the the settlement of, uh, of, of their loans. So I think this is a, f um, a huge issue that requires uh, a national attention from activists, uh, of course, but also from academics, from uh, uh, the Bar Association of Beirut in, in that sense, because this is a huge problem that we're heading into uh, where people are no longer able to settle their loans uh, uh, 
uh, even the loans that they have that they have got in uh, Lebanese pounds, uh, but for people who have uh, lost their uh, power, uh, their purchase power, and uh, for people who have lost their jobs and their income all over, it's uh, they're no longer uh, able to uh, uh, pay these uh, these amounts of uh, of money in in this regard. And um, the last thing that I wanted to say is. Uh, uh, I think it's important to look into this issue, uh, not only from, and of course it's housing, but also it creates problem related to uh, transportation, traffic, uh, the overall uh, uh, planning of, of the city and the, 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 the you know, going and coming back and forth to and from the city is also uh, something really important to take into account in this regard. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I don't think that, uh, that you know, there is a very limited number. When I was a kid, we used to walk to the school. Uh, nowadays, I'm sure that the majority of children do not walk to the school uh, because, of, because people who live in Beirut are actually sending their children to schools outside Beirut and vice versa. And this is in relation to the, to the, to the overall socioeconomic landscape of the city versus of the, of the suburbs. So historically, the middle class schools, the majority of middle class schools are located in Beirut. But after the war, the majority of high, uh, high society schools, you name it, are located outside Beirut which means that people living in Beirut are creating a traffic from Beirut to the suburbs and then people living in the suburbs because they cannot afford to live in the high-end uh, apartments in, uh, in Beirut are actually sending their children to uh, Beirut from the suburbs, which is creating a cross-cutting or I don't know what we, what we can call it, uh, a traffic that is uh, putting a lot of burden on on the city, on the people, uh, on the household income, because this is cost uh, as well in terms of cars, in terms of uh, uh, fuel, in terms of uh, whatever uh, uh, the overall uh, 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 cost uh, of uh, uh, transportation in, in this regard. Uh, I think I'm done uh, with this. And uh, my last point is, uh, this is very important. The, the research that you have done is very important, but I think it needs to be, it needs to feed into, and uh, this is what Mona said is already being done, um, into um, the development of public policies, especially now that we are trying to rebuild our country, even within this uh, cracked up uh, uh, crisis. Uh, but I think it's uh, really important and uh, Thank you again for the invitation. I am really uh, uh, pleased to be part of this. Thank you, Zaina, very much for your comments. Um, I want to apologize for some lighting issues that are happening here. You can probably also hear the UPS um, buzzing. I'm sorry about that. At least I'm still connected. All right, thank you everyone. Uh, we're, we're actually kind of done with the, with the discussion and the presentation at 7.30, so that's good. We maybe have some time to kind of throw out some questions that, were, uh, that I compiled. I believe, Mona, you already took care of one. Um, you know, directly to the person who asked through the Q&A, so for, forgive us, but we will try to focus on the ones that were not addressed. Uh, we actually have four quest questions all in all, so let me go over them, and then you guys can decide which would be the most appropriate one to be answered by who. Uh, first, we have a question from Layal Naufal, and um, it is, were you able to identify the scale or role of amateur developers who were able to produce housing in Beirut or Greater Beirut? Um, was there a type of housing that resulted from their activities or any other significant trends or dynamics? Um, that's the first question. The second question that we have is from um, Mohammed Al Shama. And we have two actually, one just came in. Oh no, it's the same one. So a lot of investors are putting their lollers in real estate. Developers are accepting bankers checks to pay off debts. And happens, um, what happens to the banks when they are paid off 
by trapped money. Okay, I, I believe we all have. We all have a lot of these types of questions these days. Hopefully the housing team will be able to give us a little bit of insights on this uh, specific issue. We have uh, a question from Alan Shahade, Dean Alan Shahade, I might add. Um, it's actually a question to Mariki, uh, or at least in, uh, in reaction to Mariki's intervention. But if, some, uh, if, if we can address it, I think it will be good briefly. It's a good question. Are the dynamics that Mariki describes, so basically displacement, displacement, gentrification, reduced quality of life, are these a departure from the long-standing patterns of urban development? Um, Alan is uh, proposing to look at the example of Corniche al Mazra from 50 years ago to see if there's any comparative that can be done, any comparative perspective can be, that can be drawn here. And the last question is from uh, Francesca Keola, and it is the following. Could you address a bit more specifically how the informal sector has been expanding as a consequence of the financialization of housing and real estate in Beirut? And where exactly has, has it been expanding? Um, so I think this sums up the questions that were sent. Um, if anyone still has an intervention that they, can, they want to do vocally maybe at the end, we'll see if we have time, but please raise your hand and then we will see if we have a little bit of time at the end to attend to that. Guys, please uh, go ahead. Uh, do you guys allow me to start and sort of maybe suggest some answers that others can, uh, uh, can raise? First, I uh, want to thank really everyone for engaging and also for staying so long uh, with us. Really very much appreciated. Um, I also want to thank the discussants for engaging uh, the, the material. Uh, since Marike is left, I'll uh, skip and just answer, point to an answer to uh, Alan's question. But before I do that, I want to suggest just an order that Michel answers on the methods uh, Hisham's concern about using building permits uh, in relation to our data set. Um, and, uh, and also, really, say Zena, we uh, called on you because we love what you do. So uh, we think housing is something that is a matter for everyone, and we want it to be a public discussion. We don't want it to be just among specialists. Uh, we were really inspired by um, the way you put forward the idea of Mishdafain, and uh, also challenged to say that as a research center, uh, we want our material to be relevant. And so we want it to be in the hands of people who want to do something about housing. And so by all means, we think that the comments you're making are spot on. A lot of what you're saying about the right to housing and the connection between access to housing and public transport. And I see Dr. Tamam Ash is on the attendees and he's someone who's really taught me a lot on uh, mobility at the greater scale of the city, making it absolutely our main priority right now, also to support right to housing. So we fully, I fully agree with, with your assessment. Just wanna say that um, with, uh, uh, with uh, Soha and other members of the Urban Lab, we have put forward a proposal to investigate families who are finding it difficult to pay their housing loans. We think that uh, while a rule of thumb in public policy is not to allow people to pay more than 30% of their incomes on housing, people are paying more. We are aware of examples where people are not eating in the evening so that they pay their mortgage. They're trapped in mortgage schemes that they're not allowed to sell. What is heartening is that amidst this crisis, the director of the Public Housing Corporation is aware that this is happening. So we've had already a meeting with him. We're talking more. He's given us some numbers. We promised not to share, but we can tell you that your 14% is low. Um, we can also tell you that he's very aware and doing everything he can to prevent evictions legally actually, and finding ways for people to, if they decide to leave the country, resell their mortgage, and if they want to stay, to refinance their scheme. So we feel like we have one opening. We don't want to let it go, but we are, uh, we are completely convinced that the right to housing cannot just be about improving mortgage, that it has to be, and I'm sure you agree with us, that it has to be um, a larger intervention that, uh, de-financializes housing and gets public agencies to recover some of the housing stock uh, 
that exists right now in limbo, whether through amateur developers, whether through the old rent control uh, to recover it and render it substance for people to get housing so that the local authorities are empowered to do something about the right to housing. For those of you who are not in Beirut, it's the first time in my life, and I lived in the city throughout the civil war like Zena, um, that we see people living in the lobbies of buildings. What I used to see as a student in the United States uh, and I used to, it used to scandalize me, I'm now seeing in Beirut. So this is really unprecedented and we need to do something beyond just making housing affordable, uh, recognizing the right to shelter. So very much from this imperative, um, we also think that this, that the entry point of amateur developers, uh, and maybe uh, Abir, you can elaborate a little bit further on this. Uh, we think that the issue of amateur developers is very important in uh, tackling housing policy. So how many they are and how um, should come through uh, this perspective. Um, Again, quickly for Muhammad Shama, money is a fiction. From A to Z, money is a fiction. You want to read Sapiens? I keep telling you guys to read Sapiens. I haven't really read the whole book, uh, but he tells you money is a fiction, and uh, uh, and basically. As long as you believe in the fiction, it works. We're not believing anymore in the Lebanese bonds, so, so it's crumbling. But the banks and the developers, they're together in it, right? If uh, so, how you may want to talk a little bit more about this um, and explain this, but that's why they are eager to sell each other. And let Soha talk a little bit more about it. I want to address a topic really close to my heart, which is the issue that Francesca is raising. Hi, Francesca on informality. Um, we started describing informality as uh, the sector in which people follow regulations that are not state regulations in order to secure housing. So we called informality the process through which informal laws, laws that are supported by social institutions, uh, social agencies, reg rules that are supported by social institutions and agencies actually allow for transactions to happen. And I I started my research in Hayes Salom, which is Beirut's largest informal settlement, demonstrating that it was not lawless, uh, that it was actually very much supported by uh, religious organizations, local political parties, and family networks. This kind of uh, support that allowed us to understand what made informal settlements work is actually coming now to elucidate why Beirut's housing market works at the very top. So developers don't, cannot manage the market unless they know the political class. And they change the laws and they bend the laws. And they build a lot of their transactions, not because they trust the legal court system, because no one does, but because they trust the informal networks that allows them to work together towards housing accessibility. That's why we're expanding this knowledge of informality, refusing to criminalize the poor for bending the law, and instead saying everyone is bending the law, there is a regulatory problem at the core of things. The rich may bend it differently than the poor, but everyone is doing it. And so um, we need to be aware of this. It's very much from this perspective that I think so has research uh, demonstrating the, the elements of the growth machine alludes to this notion of informality uh, on which I insist. Um, I think we also missed Alan's question. Uh, I'll take just one minute, sorry guys. So in terms of whether there's something qualitative, in 1970, David Harvey wrote that the built environment is becoming integrated in uh, the growth machine. He described the way in which surplus capital was working to displace. Uh, to, uh, to use that surplus capital was using state institutions in order to be rechanneled towards the built environment. At that time, capital was still very much contained. And so how much it could influence the built environment existed, but was still limited. It was also at that time that people began to write about gentrification and displacement as important topics of uh, research. And Hisham's shown this in his thesis, very much in Beirut as well, being uh, pushed forward by public agencies. What has happened 
now is that a qualitative transformation has happened in the fact that we're not displacing people so that we occupy the houses by people who are richer. We're displacing people so that we have safety deposit boxes in the city, empty apartments. This is where our vacancy research is so important. What it's saying is that it's no longer about displacing one social group to replace it by another. It's displacing one social group to change the whole understanding of the urban from a city where people can live, work, meet, be creative, invent an economy, invent lives and futures to a place that you buy and sell and use as the collateral and hide and keep empty. And that is very dangerous because that means that the whole city is hijacked and the capability, the livelihoods that people have to be able to create uh, possible uh, futures is basically taken away from them when the land, the ground, the very substance of life is taken away. Similar arguments have been made about water and I think they're equally important, but that's why we feel there's something qualitatively important. And because Marik is not here, I'll just say that she was the first one in her research to point to the way in which banks were making massive profits out of this practice. And that's why I think it's very important to keep it. I'm sorry I'm speaking too much. I think everyone would like to add stuff. Feel free to also add more on stuff I forgot to answer. Michelle, you want to start? Tapsuhayela, start. I think Michelle. Yeah, I want to say thank you for Hisham, for your notes, for Zena and for Marike. Uh, as uh, uh, Muna, I'm going to answer your, uh, the question you suggested I answer, uh, Layal's question about the amateur, uh, amateurs. Uh, so actually what we're doing now, uh, it's, a, it's a huge process of defining what an amateur is. And uh, it's really about back and forth and uh, continuous discussions, internal discussions. But what we can say is that there's, if you're talking about a building typology that an amateur did, we cannot say that uh, there's a definite building typology that can be assigned to amateurs. Amateurs have uh, penetrated different segments of the city of Beirut, and therefore they have produced uh, different building typologies. So uh, what we know uh, today from our survey is that 75% uh, of the developers have one to two projects in Beirut. This is what we know, but still we are trying to uh, filter them out to see what percentage of them is actually amateurs in the sense that uh, they, uh, they have only uh, entered the market for a short period of time and they, it's not their first or second project and they are continuing in the market. So uh, saying that, uh, we know that uh, amateurs, uh, for example, might be uh, uh, people expats coming from, uh, from abroad or doctors that have excess, uh, excess amount of money by working abroad and they are putting their money in the built environment by building projects either for them to, to stay in for personal use or for uh, selling them again and uh, make generating profits. We also know that there are amateurs that uh, we can say they, uh, who are uh, people from the local community who had some businesses and had excess money from, from a certain business that they are be channeling into the built environment in order to uh, diversify their profits and uh, generate more, uh, more revenues. Uh, another profile of an amateur would be someone who uh, saw that the market is really peaking and, uh, and he wanted, if you want uh, to have a share in the pie that everyone is having, and consequently decided to uh, sell out all of, the, all of his resources and uh, invest in real estate. Uh, in this uh, situation, some of these developers end up having successful projects, while most of them, because they do not have the needed social networks and the needed uh, ingredients for, uh, for properly access, accessing the housing market, would end up either defaulting or having legal issues in the municipality or not being able to, to pass on the permitting issues 
or would even uh, we uh, we have even encountered some developers who ended up having problems due to their penetration of uh, into uh, into neighborhoods that if if we want to say it uh, they do not have uh, the, the needed networks to be able to operate and because they belong to different sectarian identity or to different political identity so so there's really a broad uh, spectrum of what an amateur is in Beirut. And uh, this is what, what really is interesting and requires an in-depth uh, investigation uh, that we are currently doing and, and, profiling, uh, and profiling amateur developers. So the building typology is really uh, not specific and is very diverse. So for example, Bobo, which um, uh, I think he's a, a, a developer that came from abroad. So he might, a developer might end up having a very high-end project uh, or uh, a project that he's not able to uh, complete. Um, yeah, so this is uh, my answer regarding this. I also wanted to add, uh, add a bit, uh, I don't want to take a lot of time, but I just wanted to add to uh, Marike's uh, comment because it goes in line with, with what I'm saying now, that uh, really what she was, uh, I think it's really interesting that what she was profiling is, uh, is one type of, uh, of uh, developers that have, uh, that came from, uh, from uh, abroad and decided to, uh, uh, invest in Lebanon, and they saw that, uh, according to what she says, uh, they they have uh, chosen to go into uh, neighborhoods where the net, where the sectarian identity is a bit diluted there. While if you go into uh, neighborhoods where uh, there's uh, inner neighborhoods in the city, we see that uh, the sectarian politics play a major role in in that. Uh, in that areas. So yeah, that's basically. Thank you, Abir. Thank you, everyone, for the team uh, for handling all of these questions. I believe we covered most of what was uh, what was um, asked. Uh, I think you know we're, we're close to eight, and we should we should call it a session. Uh, people probably want to now retreat to the rest of their lives. But before I leave you, I would like to thank you again for attending, for those who stayed with us until the very end. Of, obviously, to the presenters today, Abir, Michelle, Soha, Mona, um, everyone in the lab who worked on this today, definitely our discussants, Hisham, Zena, and Mariki, thank you again. Lastly, I would just like to remind you that next week we will have our third edition of the webinar series. We are very happy to be having Lisa Weinstein um, taking the, um, the helm there, right? I mean, being the, the main uh, uh, speaker. And we also have Michele Lanconi and Heba Abu Akar as discussants. We hope that we're gonna see um, all of you who were with us today next time and uh, there will be announcements sent out uh, shortly. Thank you again. Have a good night. We love you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you.